Thank you so much. Uh, this is one of those rare years where Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday. Normally we would be having this service in the evening, and uh, but we're combining everything into a regular Sunday morning service with the combined with the normal traditional Christmas Eve service that we do. So <clears throat> if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. We've been doing this series this month on the royal names of the Messiah. When Isaiah spoke this prophecy, the people in Israel would not have immediately understood that it was about the Messiah that was coming. They would not have understood this, there are two famous Christmas passages in Isaiah, this one in Isaiah chapter 9 and in Isaiah chapter 7, where we have the famous, uh, Behold, a virgin shall give birth. They wouldn't have understood it the way that we did because Isaiah was written in Hebrew. The Hebrew word that Isaiah used is Mara. What it means is a young woman. It can mean a young unmarried woman. It can mean a young married woman. So they wouldn't have understood the connotation that we do and that's because later on when Matthew quotes Isaiah, he quotes Isaiah and translates it into Greek. Now the word that Matthew uses is a very specific. It's virgin and doesn't have any generalized meaning. And, th and we sort of see that God was giving this message. Actually began in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 when he told that the seed of the woman would step or smite the head of the serpent. That gave us the first hint of what we know as the virgin birth. Isaiah narrowed it down to a young woman. Matthew narrows it specifically down to one woman, Mary. And so... These titles, we tend to focus more on the um, divine part of these titles, and we ignore or miss sometimes the royal meaning of these titles. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward even forever the seal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This morning we're going to be talking about the last of those royal titles the Prince of Peace. We begin by asking, what is peace? How would they have understood it? The Hebrew word here is shalom. There are three meanings associated with it, the way they would have understood it, especially in the context of a king and of royalty. Their first definition is the one most often associated with the term peace, and that is an absence of of hostility. And that's the way that we normally think of peace. We're not fighting. Um, I know a lot of times, this time of the year, even some families, they have peace in the fact that they, it's sort of like we have a ceasefire. It's like, okay, we won't fight today, we'll wait till next week. And then we'll pick up where we left off. The word here means so much more than just an absence of hostility. It's not, a, it's not a ceasefire, okay? There's a lot more added to the meaning here. 
But for too many of us, that's what we've come to associate it with is that peace is just, well, we're not fighting today. The second definition that was associated with this word is a prosperous social system. In other words, they were looking at the community that the king would rule over. And they were thinking, the king will allow us to be prosperous. The king will allow us to live our lives. It's amazing when you look at the world in so many different areas that the things that are lacking so much in the world. And I've talked with people who are much more expert at this because they have experiences in different countries. And, and the problem is because they tend to be so dominated by a small group of people. And they may say that they're doing one thing, but it's, it's amazing how there is a, a prosperous social system. And, and that's something that if you go back and you read the law of Moses, you can find that the law of Moses was designed to bring this kind of prosperity. It doesn't mean that everybody's the same. It doesn't mean that everybody's equal. It doesn't mean that everybody has the same thing. But it means that everybody has opportunities. That's one of the great things about the law of Moses is that it allowed actually rights and this was extraordinary in the ancient world, it allowed rights to the aliens. It allowed rights to the orphans. The people that basically didn't have anybody to protect them and to guard them, God said, I will be their protector. We read about this in great detail in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament where a young Moabite woman who comes in and who had been married to a Hebrew, but he had died, and she comes in with her mother-in-law. And because there is a law that people are following, there was an opportunity for her to go and gather food so that she could have bread to feed herself and her mother-in-law. We see that that system was working because there were people there who were following the law. And so when the children of Israel heard this about the Prince of Peace, they would say, okay, not only is it going to be that we're not at war, but we're actually <clears throat> in a place where uh, a social system is at work, where people have rights, where people are provided for, where people have opportunities that they don't have in other lands. And the last definition that's associated with this word is the practice of justice for all. Justice. It's amazing when you go, when you look. This is one of the key factors between when you look at the prosperity of a country like ours and you look at other countries in different parts of the world that are ruled by dictators. And again, I was listening to an expert talk about this and he said the biggest thing is there is a, a legal system that protects the rights of people. You say here in this country we're protected in the sense that if you come up with a great idea, you can be born in poverty, but if you come up with a great idea and you implement it and you follow it, you can become a millionaire because we have laws to protect your ideas. In other countries where those laws don't exist, you can come up with a great idea and the people in power will steal it from you and take it away and deprive you of any opportunity of gain from that. So they were looking at it and they understood the Prince of Peace will bring this to us, this sense of justice where people are taken care of, where people are watched after, where we're protected as a country. It's interesting that in, the, in <clears throat> how this has become twisted around in, 
at Christmas time, when we think of the Prince of Peace, we always think, well, he's going to bring peace on earth, because isn't that what the angels said? Peace on earth. And we think somehow something is going to happen where people are going to hear the teachings of Jesus, where they're going to follow the teachings of Jesus, and they're going to lay down their arms and do as the prophet says, beat their swords and their spears into plows, and instead of killing, they'll be farming and gardening. And we think, surely this is going to happen. In the history of Israel, they looked at the time of Solomon as the greatest prince of peace in their history. One of the things that are noteworthy about Solomon, and t Solomon was able to rise up at a time, and he was the most powerful figure in the Middle East at that time because the Syrians were waning, the Egyptians were waning as major powers, and Solomon developed the most powerful military in his day, and he brought peace to the land. Solomon had a lot of things going on, and so they held him up as their example of who they would have thought of. Now, we need to understand something about the world that we live in. And there are a lot of people who don't understand this, but we need to be reminded of it, and we get reminded of it too often in the world that we live in. There are people in groups who practice domination. Basically, they want to take what you have and take it away from you. They'll try to convince you that they're doing you a good thing, but they're not. We've always had these groups who are seeking power, who are seeking domination. Through history, we can record them. We've been going through a series and on Wednesday nights that we finished last week on Daniel and we've learned about the ancient empires that were looking for domination. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and on down and on down. We've seen it in the last century with the rise and fall of Nazi Germany. We've seen it with the rise and fall of the Soviet Union and People are scared again because of the rebirth of the Russian Empire and the Chinese and the crazy guy in North Korea. We worry about these kinds of groups. These groups have always been around. These groups will always be around until. Now what's interesting is that the apostles won't what we want in society as well. The apostles wanted political solutions. That's the thing that they asked Jesus about after he was resurrected. Their question was, and recorded in Acts chapter 1, and it was, Jesus, will you at this time, and they phrased it nicely, but basically what they were asking him is, Jesus, will you kick out the Romans and put us back in charge again? And since we're your right-hand men, then we'll be your able ministers and we'll establish rule in the world the way that it should be. And they thought that was a wonderful idea. Don't we all? We all look at the things that are going on in the world and most of us think, well, I could do better than that. I could solve this problem. It's amazing how many people think that way and how they never solve the problem. It's interesting, and we often ignore this, the answer that Jesus gave. And that was, Jesus said to wait on the Father's timing. Basically, he said, look, you don't know, but it's not the right time. Now, is there a right time? Yes, that time is coming. It's amazing that we think about Jesus as the Prince of Peace, but how will he ultimately bring peace on this earth in total and in full? And we read about that in the 19th chapter of Revelation when he will come with 
millions of others and he will lead his army to this earth and he will destroy the powers of sin and darkness and he will destroy the evil and he will vanquish his enemies. Because as long as sin and evil are present in this world, as long as there are people who want to steal from you and kill you and deprive you of whatever it is that they want from you, those people sometimes will not listen to reason. Those people will sometimes not listen to the voice of peace. And the only thing that they will listen to is when they are defeated. It's a sad fact of the world that we live in. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and Jesus will ultimately bring peace to this earth. But that time will not come until he returns. Then there will truly be peace on earth the way we long for it to be. But what kind of peace is he bringing now? You see, Jesus took on a much tougher assignment. You see, it's easy if you can build up your military as the Americans did in World War II and you can outproduce your enemy and you can defeat them on the battlefield. The army, armies of oppression have been defeated throughout history at various times. That's why none of those empires that I've mentioned exist anymore because they ultimately face defeat. Jesus rather took on a harder job and that was he took on, I want to bring peace to you as an individual. You see, that's something that no government can do. That's something that no law can pass, can bring about. Jesus said, I will give you peace in your heart. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. The peace that comes in our hearts. Now, we need to understand that there's a conflict in each person. Everybody has it, young, old, in between. We have this conflict in our heart. To put it in its simplest terms, there's, and we express it in a number of ways, and sometimes on the old cartoons you used to see, there would be an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder, and they would be telling you, the angel would be telling you, here's the right thing to do. And the devil would be saying, no, here's this thing to do. And the devil's argument is always, it'll be fun. The best answer to Satan's response I heard years ago, and that is a minister said one time, you always have to remember all of Satan's apples have worms. And that brings back the old adage, what's worse than finding a worm in an apple? Half a worm in an apple. Because you bit into it. So there's always a conflict in each person. Paul talks about this on much rarefied terms in the book of Romans especially in Romans chapter 7 where he sort of sums it up like this and he says I really want to do good but it doesn't matter how much I try to do good occasionally I mess up anybody there with Paul You want to do good, 
And you know, sometimes, and I've done this myself, and I hope you're not guilty of this, but I suspect you are. Have you ever said something, and as the words are coming out of your mouth, it's just a sign is going off in your brain. Wrong. Mistake. You're in trouble now. And it's always amazing the answer. Oh, I didn't mean that. Then why did you say it? Or we come up with excuses. Oh, you, I got off the wrong side of the bed this morning. You know, whatever. We've become experts at excuses, experts at trying to explain away. And that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Adam messed up, sin, God showed up, said, did you do what I told you not to do? Now Adam, instead of being the forthright man that he was, the man who would say, yes, I did it, Lord, please forgive me. No, he rather turned into the loving husband who said, it was the woman that you gave me, Lord, by implication. God, if you hadn't given me this woman, I wouldn't have messed up. And you see, that's the problem. Whenever you're trying to tell somebody it wasn't my fault, it was somebody else's, ultimately what you're saying is, God, it's your fault. Now, Ad Eve was a quick learner. I'm going to give her that because when God looked at Eve and said, what have you got to say? She said, it was the serpent. And if you go back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, you'll read it says, now the serpent was the most subtle of creatures that the Lord God had made. What has she done again? She's blaming God. Only time in the Bible I feel sorry for the serpent. Because he didn't have anyone to blame. You know, there's a conflict in each person. Paul talks about it and he says, the good that I would do, that I do not. The evil I would not do, that I do. Paul comes up and he calls these two conflicting forces that are going on within us. He comes up with a name for him. The bad one he calls the old man. The good one he calls the new man. He calls it, and it's sort of his representation because Adam, he says, represents the old man, the one that messed up and who continues to mess up. And Jesus is the new man. The new man who gives us hope. The new man who gives us life. The new man who shows us the right way to do things. So there's this conflict. And Paul, again, has a very drastic solution for the answer. How do you bring peace? Well, in the world, the way you bring peace, if you've got a good country and a bad country, is to really bring lasting peace, the bad country has to be defeated. Not just confined, defeated. And Paul says basically in the spiritual sense the same thing is true. The old man must die. And you know that's the symbolism behind baptism. That's why we immerse people because... It represents the old man dying and you come up out of the water and that represents the new man being resurrected to new life. The old man must die. How do we kill the old man? It's this wonderful thing called repentance. You repent. You turn away. It's a change of direction. We're not going in that path any longer. And so we repent. We take 
the thing that Adam failed to do. We take responsibility and say, I messed up. I am a sinner. And you recognize you need something that you don't have. You need forgiveness. And that's where Jesus comes in. Jesus was born with a specific purpose in mind. He was born that he would live a perfect life without sin. And that one day he would die, not for himself, not for his own transgressions, not for his own sins, but he would die for all of us. All of us who are the children of Adam, he would die for. So that we might have a way back to God. And so he came. And just as Jesus died, so our old man must die. How do we put him to death? We repent. We ask God for forgiveness. We ask him to come into our lives. And it's amazing the imagery that you see throughout the New Testament. And what do we call this transformation from darkness into light? We call it a new birth. We call it being born again. We say, this, I was dead in trespasses to sin, but now I am raised to new life through Jesus Christ. This whole imagery of life coming because the new man is raised to life in God. And that's what we have. Life in God. And so we experience, we're waiting and we're praying for that day when Jesus will bring peace to this earth in fullness and completeness. But in the meantime, can we experience that peace? Yes, each one of us can experience the peace of God in our hearts. We can experience that fullness of life. Peace, not just the absence of violence, but all that makes life worth living. God brings that into our hearts. God brings that into our life. And we have new life through Christ our Lord. And so he is our Prince of Peace. And he brings us peace. And he will bring peace to this earth one day too in its fullness. There will come a time when all of the evil in this world will be put down, when all the evil will be vanquished. And we pray for that. Did you know that? We pray for that every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Now Jesus told his apostles, now you need to understand this. Because I'm here, the kingdom is already here, but the kingdom is still coming. We call it the already not yet. So Jesus is here and he's here and in those of us who've accepted him as Lord and Savior he brings peace in our hearts that the world cannot know. But he's also still coming. And so that's why we remember, as in a few moments when we celebrate communion, we remember, and as Paul would say, we remember this and we remind ourselves this. And communion is not just a reminder of the Lord's death but it is a reminder of his return so and we're going to celebrate that now I'm going to ask Brother Dave and those who are going to be involved in that to come
and distribute the elements of communion as we remember that. The life and the death of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would bless these elements that we're about to receive. We ask, God, that you would touch our hearts today as we remember and we celebrate what you have brought into this world and the peace that you have given to us today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.